most devices under Linux can be used by multiple processors at the exact same time. Things like, say, my microphone, my audio input, my speakers, my audio output, my networking, my keyboards, my storage. Just imagine how annoying it would be if, for example, you're networking. If one program was using your networking, nothing else on your computer could actually use that. That would be basically unusable. And there is one thing on my system that I use very frequently that doesn't act like this. And that is USB video devices. So if I have a program like, say, OBS using my camera, no other programs can use that camera. You might be wondering, though, why would you ever want to send your camera to multiple places? Well, one use case that I have is I record a podcast. And I usually do this as a video podcast where I will send my video feed over something like Discord or Jitsi. And then I will capture that entire window inside of OBS and crop stuff out to make it so it fits my overlay. But this means that my camera is going to look way, way worse than it actually should be. But it's still a better result than my guest just not being able to see me altogether. So if I go into Discord right now, so my camera is the Camlink 4K. That's the capture card my camera is actually attached to. If I try to test my video, because the camera is attached to OBS, this isn't going to work. And there's countless other use cases, a few of which I'll show you a bit later in the video. Now, luckily for us, it's actually really easy to fix this problem. What we need to do is make a virtual camera device. Basically, what we're going to be doing is taking our camera feed and then looping it into a device that only exists in software. And for some reason, I don't know why the drivers work like this, this virtual device does not have the same limitation and can be used by any number of processors at once. What we're going to be using is a kernel module known as V4L2 loopback. So V4L2 stands for Video for Linux 2. This is basically the standard drivers being used for any UVC cameras under Linux. So UVC stands for USB video class. Basically, any webcam or capture card that you plug into Linux through USB is almost certainly going to be a UVC device. By default, we're not actually able to make loopback devices. This kernel module, however, adds in that functionality. Now, I can't speak for every single Linux distro out there, but I know that on both Arch Linux and Ubuntu, this is actually packaged. So if you're on Arch Linux, what you can do is you can do a sudo pacman dash s and then v4l2 loopback dash DKMS, and that is going to be what we need. If you're on Ubuntu, I believe you can drop the dash DKMS and you will find it, but just go and look it up for your distro and it almost certainly will be packaged. This isn't required, but it will make things a little bit easier. I would also recommend going and installing V4L utils. Basically what these are going to do is give you a CLI tool to actually go and control your V4L devices. This will just make it a bit easier to work out what devices are actually connected to what cameras. Now, if you did install the V4L utils, what you can do is a V4L2-CTL. I know we're changing the names a lot. I don't know why it's packaged like this. And then a dash dash list dash devices. And then this will list out every single one of the camera devices connected to your system. The reason why I recommend using this command over just doing a ls slash dev. Firstly, there is a lot of extra stuff in here that you don't really care about for what we're doing here. The other reason, though, is that most cameras are going to have multiple video devices. This is just to do with storing metadata and some other stuff to make the camera do all of its magical camera things. So the two reasons why we did this is firstly, we want to work out what device is actually a part of that camera. But the other reason is we want to go and give our loopback device a number. And we don't want to have that number actually clash with anything because that would cause some pretty big problems. So in my case, I am using 0 and 1. If I plug in my other capture card, I believe that'll take us up to 4. So in my case, if I set it to 5 or above, that is going to be safe. If you want to be extra safe though, just set it to something like 10 or 20. Most people probably aren't going to have that many cameras plugged in. If we go and do a sudo mod probe, V4L2 loopback, this time without the dash, that is going to be enough to get the virtual camera actually running. But we want to go and set an ID, so video underscore NR for video number. In my case, I'm going to set that to 5. 
Now, we can also go and set a card label. Basically, this is going to be the name that programs like OBS or programs like this right here actually detect as the name. You don't have to set a name, but if you're going to make multiple virtual cameras, setting a name is going to make it much easier to work out which one actually is which. If you don't set a name, though, I believe it'll be set to something like dummy video device. So let's go and set it to card underscore label equals, let's go with virtual camera. Now, if you're not going to be using programs like, say, Jitsi or Discord or really anything that uses WebRTC, you don't need to include this last option, but it doesn't actually hurt to do so. So in a lot of cases, programs like that won't actually detect the camera unless you include exclusive underscore caps equals one, basically enable exclusive caps. So if we go and run that now and then run the previous command, as we can see, that camera has now been made. Now, your mileage may definitely vary with this. Sometimes you may need it, sometimes you may not, but it's always safer just to include it, just to make sure it is going to work. If you want to read the documentation on what it exactly does, though, that is listed in the readme on the GitHub page. Now that we have the virtual device, now we can actually do the loopback. So firstly, we have to work out which one of these video devices actually is the actual video device with the video stream. So there's a couple of ways we can work this out, but an easy way to do so is by running v4o2-ctl-device, then passing in the device path. So let's go and do video zero first, and then dash dash all. So this is going to list out all of the properties of the device. So in this case, as we can see, there are some settings in here that relate to actually how the camera will look. If we go and compare that to doing it on video one, that is just going to have some metadata and stuff that isn't really that useful. So the first device was the device we actually need. Another very easy way to do this, though, is take the device, let's say dev video zero, and just go and launch it up in a program like MPV or like VLC, because these are just video streams and will work perfectly fine in these programs. Now, obviously for me, it's not going to work because I'm currently using the camera, but when I'm not recording, that will just open up a feed of my camera. Now, to actually do the loopback, there's a couple of programs we can use. We can use things like FFmpeg or GStreamer. I'm going to use FFmpeg just because I know how to use it, but GStreamer should work perfectly fine as well. So if we go and run FFmpeg, dash i for the input device. The input device is going to be slash dev slash video zero. Then we can go pass in dash f. This is for the video format. In this case, the video format is v4l2. Then we can do a dash codec colon v, which is the exact same thing as doing a v codec. This is basically the video codec. In this case, we're going to be working with raw video because we're working with a raw video stream. Then we need to pass in the color space or the pixel format. And we do this with a dash pix underscore FMT for pixel format. Now, by default, you're probably going to want to set this to something like YUV420P. But there are other color spaces you can use. For example, things like RGB24. I typically run my videos like this. I don't know which one is technically more color accurate. I find that... RGB24 looks a little bit better though. Then we pass in the output device. This is going to be, in my case, slash dev slash video 5. But if you chose a different number, then choose that number instead. So I've swapped over to a different scene where I'm actually using this camera. If we go and run the command now, and then I go and just restart my camera inside of OBS. So if we do that, I think that should get it working. Yep, cool. So as you can see, it's working exactly as it should. Now, obviously, you don't have to run this in a terminal window. You could just go and like run this in the background somewhere. But this is where we get into actually using the camera. So it's supposed to be easy in programs like OBS. In Discord, it's dead simple. So if I now go over to the virtual camera here, go test video. Now, it's working exactly as it should. I know Discord like mirrors the camera but except for that, it's working exactly as it should be. So OBS, on the other hand, is a little bit jank. What you're supposed to be able to do in OBS is go to your webcam, go to its properties, 
and there will be a thing in here to select the video device. Now you might notice that the part in here there where it says device is uh is red. And that's because I can't actually select the device. The way I'm actually using this device is not by selecting it in the GUI. For whatever reason, these virtual cameras cannot be selected, at least with my install of OBS. So we have to actually go into the, uh, the OBS config files and put it in from there. Luckily though, doing that is still really, really easy. So if you're using the non flat pack version of OBS, your config files are going to be located in .config slash OBS studio. If you are using the flat pack version, it should be something like .var slash .local slash something slash OBS. Check where config files are located for the flat pack version though. Once you find the OBS studio folder though, everything in here will be exactly the same. So if we go into the basic folder, then into the scenes folder, as you're going to see, Everything in here is just a JSON file. So if I want to go and modify it for my standard recording scene, for example, what I'm going to do, firstly, uh, I'm going to make sure I can read stuff. Uh, if your editor lets you do that, that will make your life much, much simpler. If it doesn't, well, just search for stuff and you'll be fine. So if we go and search for device, as you're going to see, there's a couple of things in here that have a device ID. So this right here is for my microphone. That's not what we care about. What we're looking for is something that looks a bit like this. Slash dev, slash v4l, and then a bunch of other stuff, or slash dev, slash video, and then a number. You can also scroll up just a bit, and you'll see the actual name of the... You act You'll see the actual name of the thing inside of OBS. This is my webcam. That's obviously what we need. So if I go and just change this from what it currently is over to being slash dev slash video five, and then look for any other instances where that might actually be the case. And it seems like that's the only one for this scene. Then we should be good to go. Now I'm back over my standard scene. So if we go into our OBS camera settings, so right in here, as we can see, now it's set to slash dev slash video 5. I don't know why my version of OBS isn't detecting the camera properly. Your version might see it just fine. But for whatever reason, mine always seems to be a little bit jank. Now, speaking of jank, I haven't noticed it breaking like this. So even though you're modifying the config to use a camera that OBS doesn't particularly like, you should be good to go. I've probably streamed about 20 or so hours like this and never had the camera just break. The only break I have had is, I'll just show you this. So if we go and test the virtual camera and then we stop testing the virtual camera, as you can see, uh, the video has now frozen. I don't know why that happens. It only happens with Discord. It doesn't happen with anything else. So... As long as you don't stop testing the video, you're also good. One thing to note is you can have a physical camera locked down by just a single thread. So for example, my camera is being used by the thread that is controlling this webcam right here. So if I wasn't using a virtual camera, I wouldn't be able to go and open up a second camera that is on a completely separate device. But because I am using these virtual devices, I can make as many of these as I want. So if I want to do something dumb in a stream like make a big stretched webcam, that's something I can actually do. For me, this is basically everything I want to do with these virtual cameras, but I've only really scratched the surface on what they're actually capable of. If you want to go check out the wiki, I'll leave that link to down below. There's a couple of extra use cases listed in here. They're not the most most well documented and this is the main reason why I actually made this video because doing my specific use case while you might think it's here it's not actually this OBS studio use case is actually turning OBS basically into a camera and then sending that to something like zoom or big blue button or Jitsi or something like that so you can have like scenes and stuff basically as your webcam let me know down below if you actually found this useful, and if you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, please do check out my Patreon subscribers that leave pay all linked in the description. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays where I live stream twice a week, upload about five or so YouTube shorts, and this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.